Sorry, we're running a little bit late. We had a little floor action today and it ran a little bit longer than expected. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and call the uh, transportation, uh, House Transportation Committee to order. First item on the agenda is uh, bill introductions. Do we have any bill introductions? Okay, seeing none, we're going to uh, move right on to uh, our presentation on road usage charges. And I'm sure all of you are aware of road usage charges or RUC. That's a, a, a terminology that we're using on how we're going to address uh, the coming of the electric vehicles that don't pay the traditional fuel charges that we're used to. And our first presenter today is uh, Joel Skelly, uh, Director of Policy for Kansas Department of Transportation. And Joel, again, I want to publicly thank you for your work on putting this presentation together. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Joel Skelly, and I'm the Director of Policy at KDOT. I do have a presentation I'm going to pull up here real quick for you. So it should be up if you see it there. So anyway, while we're pulling that up, I, I do appreciate the time uh, and opportunity to really kind of be a member of this panel that you guys are going to hear from today, uh, kind of kicking off uh, informational hearing uh, or presentations on road usage charge. Uh, is it not showing up yet? All right, thank you. So uh, as I said, my name is Joel Scali. I'm the Director of Policy. Uh, I think we're gonna have some great information that's gonna be presented to you by uh, my four other colleagues on this panel here. Uh, I'm here to really kind of set a little bit of the stage for Kansas, talk a little bit about what our study is doing right now that we've embarked on about a year and a half ago. Uh, Representative Chairman or Chairman Francis, I uh, had asked for a informational briefing on this last year under the Transportation Public Safety Budget Committee. Uh, so happy to be able to talk to the larger group as a whole here. Uh, I think it's a good move to be talking about this. And that's part of the reason why I think it's, it's important to have us here talking about the future of transportation investment. So if you go to the next slide, please. Uh, oh, one back. There you go. Thank you. So kind of want to lay out the current status of the revenue sources here in Kansas uh, is kind of setting up the situation that we have. Uh, as you'll see, we've and I think you've seen this before, Secretary Reed actually brought this to you all as part of our uh, KDOT 101. Uh, we have a diverse group of resources here in Kansas, and they all play an important role. Uh, without them, we do experience difficulties making the level of investment needed. So here's the situation. We've got this pie. We've got investments that are needed across the state. Here's how we fund those investments. If you could go to the next slide. Now I'm going to introduce a complication to that. That is about 40% of all vehicles are expected or may be electric by 2050. So imagine that we all drive vehicles currently. So imagine 40% of us at this committee uh, actually no longer driving a motor fuels vehicle uh, and now driving another fueled vehicle, whether it be by a lithium ion battery, by hydrogen fuel cell, by you name it. My crystal ball is not very clear about the future, so I don't know what the next technology is. Uh, I leave that to the smarter people in this world. Uh, but we add on top of that this continual increase in efficiency of the, the rest of the 60% of us that are continuing to drive motor fuels vehicles. As you replace your motor fuel vehicle, I don't know if you noticed the last time you bought a new vehicle unless you were buying a Hemi, like Power Cat, or not Power Cat, sorry, bad play there. Uh, if you were driving a new Hemi or something, fuel mileage might go down 
but otherwise most vehicles the fuel mileage is actually going up that also puts into play another piece of that declining revenue stream that comes into the highway fund essentially because you're maybe driving the same amount of miles but you're getting better gas mileage so you're buying less fuel which means you're paying less in motor fuels tax ultimately so if you check the next slide uh and it's not just your typical commuter car that you might think of that are electric vehicles. Ford, now Ram, I believe, has introduced uh, trucks, and they're, like, extremely popular. These Ford F-150s have sold out for I don't know how long as far as, like, future stock of being able to build them. So it's, it's coming, and it, it's across the board as far as vehicle types that are going to be moving towards different fuel sources. Uh, go to the next slide. So that leads into a bit of what we would call an implication. As we see these revenue sources changing, shifting, as far as amounts that are coming in between the less gas tax revenue and the shifting away from those vehicles that use it, we're starting to see those declines. And this, I think, I've shown in previous committees, uh, but this is a slide that projects out or that we've projected out uh, over the next 20 plus years to say, here's what we might anticipate based on a lot of these trends that we're seeing uh, across the motor vehicle fleet, which as I mentioned, is not just electric vehicle introduction, it's also the motor fuels vehicles that are actually increasing in their MPG that they get, the CAFE standards. That revenue as it decreases cuts back on the amount of motor fuels, that slice of pie, that revenue that we get. Uh, as you start thinking about that, if we still need the same amount of funding to basically do that investment that we're currently doing to keep our roads in good condition to meet our expansion needs and our modernization needs on the highways, we need to backfill that some other way. So without another revenue source, without something like a road use charge or other alternative revenue source, we're reliant then more and more on the other pieces of that pie. As you've heard probably and seen, the federal government's not really in the place right now with the political will to make changes to the motor fuels tax at the federal level. We haven't had a change in decades, uh, quite frankly, and it's not expected to move that direction. So we then have the good fortune in Kansas of having sales tax as part of our revenue stream. But that means that we become more reliant on that sales tax. That's not necessarily a sustainable thing. And that's not necessarily what we would consider a strong tie in a user fee source. Uh, so again, this is a way to start looking at things and why we're studying this. So if you go to the next slide, it should show you some potential options. So these are possible user pay solutions that are being discussed, uh, researched, and actually just talked about or promoted. So special registration surcharges for electric vehicles. We've done that here in Kansas. We actually did that, I think, about four or five years ago. And Chairman Francis I, was a part of that. And I think several of you on the committee were a part of that discussion. That is a, a first or initial step where we actually increased the amount of registration that somebody pays on an electric vehicle over a standard registration for a motor fuels vehicle, trying to meet some of that loss that we're experiencing by an electric vehicle, not otherwise than paying any motor fuels vehicle fuel tax for the usage of that road, essentially. The next one down is what we're talking about or what we're researching here in Kansas and what a multitude of other states and quite frankly the federal government is looking at is mileage based road usage charges. That's where you basically and I think some other folks may talk about this here in our panel. That's where you start looking at the road as the utility essentially. Uh, so think of it like a water bill that I've kind of used in some other presentations. You pay for what you use ultimately. So you think of the roads as that utility, you pay for what you use. Uh, so it moves away from, in a sense, the tie to the fuel that you use. So instead of motor fuels tax, you look at maybe electric, and there is a bill that I know is out uh, in this session that considers a tax on charging for vehicles, electric vehicles. Uh, 
that's a val valid conversation to have, and I'm glad we're going to have it. I think the, the question is, do we look at that and say, this is, the, this is our future? As I mentioned, my crystal ball is not very clear. I don't know if we're going to end up in the same spot that we were in or we're in now in a matter of less time because of a transition because, from technology to another vehicle fleet type as far as a propellant. So what I've said in the past to folks when I talk about this across the state is, we like to think of this as being fuel agnostic. It, it doesn't take into account what the fuel is. We, we, we don't really care. It's looking at how you use or utilize the roads. So that next slide, if you would. This map uh, kind of shows and talks a little bit of more about the registration rates that have gone up. So all the colored maps that are states here, there's 31 of them have some sort of special registration fee for either plug-in EVs uh, or other hybrid vehicles uh, as we do. Uh, many states that have these are now exploring more fair alternatives to these flat fees because again this is a flat fee so if you drive 100 miles a year or 100,000 miles a year. I know nobody's driving 100,000 miles but if you drive a great distance different you're technically getting a better value in a sense for that rate uh, versus maybe my grandmother or my mother say not driving as much and she's paying more in a sense for that. So again, it kind of looks at that, that piece. Uh, if you'll go to the next slide, the other and slightly more new concept that's being discussed or talked about here and promoted in some states that you'll see there is uh, charging for electricity, putting a tax on the electricity that's used uh, to charge up your electric vehicle. Uh, three states have passed laws. None of them have implemented them yet uh, due to multiple different vari or variables or reasons uh, that I'm not all together familiar about. Other people on the call may be, uh, or on the panel may be, but I think it's, again, a valid conversation to have, to look at, to explore to see what that might mean. Uh, the concern right now for us is really, we don't see a whole lot of uh, research already being done or, or um, examples that we can look to to see how it's worked, lessons learned. And I, I'm always one to try and be on the leading edge. I'm a little concerned about being on the bleeding edge, as I put it. So it's one of those things that I like to be able to know kind of a better, have a better handle of what we're getting into. And so not having a whole lot of, I like letting other states do things sometimes. So, uh, but um, we are doing some of that background research on it and, and really looking at it. We're not ignoring it. We're, we're looking at it. We're considering it and really want to can, kind of keep that dialogue happening essentially. So if you go to the next slide, this is where I mentioned that I like being in a sense on the leading edge, but not the bleeding edge. You'll see this map's kind of colored here. There are several other states that have already enacted either legislation or have done research on road usage charging uh, as far as that goes. Uh, three states across the country actually have a program that's currently in place that has been in place for over a year, in some cases, actually several years. Uh, Oregon, Utah, and Virginia are those three states. We've also got four other states that are looking at enacting legislation uh, from Hawaii, Washington, Pennsylvania, and Vermont that are actually looking at and have pending legislation tied to this. As you'll notice, we are with Oklahoma in a slightly blue or gray shade of color, more so blue. Uh, those are states that are doing some research tied to this. The other ones have actually done some already demonstrations that are in green. And there are quite a few, quite frankly, that haven't done anything, which again, I'll transition in here in a minute. Well, actually I'll transition now if you wanna hit the next slide. Uh, is really looking at why did we look at this? Why are we considering this? And what I've said before is we want to make sure that we're in the conversation because if you're not at the conversation, you're not at the table, you're, if you're, you're on the menu, quite frankly, if you're not sitting there. So we want to make sure that our voice from a Midwest perspective, from Kansas perspective is being heard across the country as to what are concerns, what are ideas, what are ways that we might think would be beneficial to use or put in place as we look at transitions 
uh, from this type, one type of revenue source to another type of revenue source with vehicle fleet transition, that way we're ahead of the game in a sense, but we're not necessarily going to get run over. Uh, so the, the research that we're doing is really looking at how we might transition in those revenue sources. So if you transition to the next slide, I'll get into a little more specifics about our study. Uh, which we proposed a year, well, actually going on almost two years ago to the federal government as a request or an application for some federal funding assistance. The federal government put together a program that actually offered up fun federal funding to help do research across the country. And, and quite frankly, it was, it was an effort on the federal side of things, we believe. And the states, I think, appreciated this to look at it at a state level instead of at a federal level. Because quite frankly, you try and do something at a federal level, it's gonna be a lot more difficult to really get meaningful feedback, meaningful information. It's better to try and bring this down a little more locally or regionally. So that's where they thought, okay, let's have some states do some exploration or explorative research. Here enters Kansas. Uh, as I'd mentioned, our focus is really on bringing a Midwest perspective to this dialogue and, and the research. And in that, we brought together as a proposal looking at three primary cohorts uh, of, of areas that would be impacted or, or how RUC might be implemented and used in rural communities, the agricultural industry, and commercial trucking. And I'll get to kind of the reasons why for each of these, but I think in particular, the two on the left are the, the rural communities and the agricultural industry may be self-explanatory for us in Kansas. I mean, that we are, at, as, a, as everybody knows, a strong economically agricultural state. And that's, that's important. And we wanna make sure that that stays robust as it is. Um, and commercial trucking kind of plays a role in that. So if you wanna go to the next slide. This further kind of explains our proposal and what we have uh, for our research. Uh, you'll see on the left is our outreach or our phase one. This was really trying to set a baseline for ourselves as an agency, as well as some of our sister agencies, which you might all be thinking, okay, well, you're talking, Joel, about a whole lot of revenue and being collected, and, and how does that work? Well, we don't do that, do we? It's the Department of Revenue that does that. So we are working actively with the Department of Revenue to make sure that as we explore this option, they're involved, they're at the table, not on the menu, to have those conversations. Okay, here's, here's what we think might be feasible. Here's, okay, you got a major problem here. This isn't going to work. This isn't feasible. So we're also talking with our other sister agencies. We're talking with the Trans Kansas Turnpike, uh, as that is another highway that actually has its own revenue stream. Uh, but how do you kind of marry those two so that there's not, you know, I mean, right now we're paying gas tax and a toll. Uh, is there a way that that shifts away from that, that, okay, you're paying gas tax or, or a toll uh, or a road usage charge or a toll? Uh, so those conversations are, have started. We're having the build up in order to really help us then establish phase two, which we've started on now. And phase two is work towards designing a pilot based off of further in-depth research that we're doing with individuals. So we've talked with agencies, we've talked with larger groups as a whole with uh, Kansas Association of Counties, League of Kansas Municipalities, Farm Bureau. I think I've talked to Farm Bureau probably five times so far in the last year. It's been great, great dialogue. We've talked with the Kansas Motor Carriers. Uh, we've talked with a multitude of larger associations to try and help get a feel for interest or insight as to what their perception is. Uh, again, this is mainly to help us, but also to get the word out to say, hey, this, this is potentially coming. There's something that's gonna have to transition to how we pay for transportation infrastructure. We want you at the table to talk with us. We want you there. So phase two, we're in, we are designing based on some more internal research, which I'll, or, or in-depth research, which I'll talk about here in a minute, which will then transition into a phase three, which is the pilot phase of this, or actually trying things out, not necessarily for money, but trying things out, see how things work. So hit the next slide. All right, here's kind of the piece. Understanding our starting point. 
This is the further in-depth research that we just recently completed. You'll see all these dots and it actually kind of maps out, which I think is kind of neat. We did some random selection of volunteers. Well, we asked for volunteers and then tried to randomly select geographical distribution amongst, as I would mentioned, our primary cohorts, which are rural residents, the agricultural sector, and commercial trucking. We also didn't want to forget the urban sector, so we did include a few folks from the urban sector because, again, we want to get a holistic review. But we also know that as a part of our federal project that we were awarded, our focus was on the rural side of things. So we're, we're trying to get a better understanding from individuals. So we had 40 participants across these four groups actually involved and volunteered to do a 90 minute kind of interview session with some folks to, to really kind of hear about for us, our folks to hear about what are the perceptions, what's the comprehension, the preferences, desirability of product service, just really some insights about how some of this could potentially work. Uh, had great feedback, really. Uh, and when I say great feedback, I think we had a lot of good feedback, just amounts. There, I'm not going to say this is a, a pretty painting that people are like, oh, yeah, this is awesome. Let's do this. Uh, because that's not necessarily what we heard. But I think the great aspect of this feedback is we are hearing from people to know how we might move forward. So with that said, uh, next slide, if you would. Uh, we looked at this. Then based on some of that, based on what we'd heard earlier, are four themes we kind of explored here during this piece, and that's fairness and equity. I mean, those these are concerns that people have, that we know people have. Quite frankly, we all think about these things. Trust. What's the level of trust in something being enacted, some mechanism actually working and not necessarily unfairly charging me or anything like that? Or, or the agency that administers it, knowing what they're doing, having this functional. Uh, then the last two are really kind of a comprehension and acceptance. Do I understand what I'm doing or what's happening? And am I okay with it? And the last is really like if, if I'm okay with it or if I'm not, necessarily okay with it, but okay, I'll, I'll, I'll work with it. How do I want to work with it? How, how would we implement it? So next slide, if you don't mind. I want to go over a few things that we kind of heard from some of these sessions. You'll see them. I don't want to read them off necessarily. You've got them all in front of you. But as I'd mentioned, we had researchers engage uh, with the participants in a 90-minute kind of session to talk about these things. And here's some of the stuff that we heard. I want, I want to hit a couple of them at least. And, and it's really um, understanding where these participants are coming from, uh, gathering the impressions, those sorts of things. So part of this is really important to us because we're trying to successfully work with our customers ultimately. And, and, and our customers are are you guys, or is everybody, quite frankly, uh, in Kansas. So we want to make sure that we're putting something out that's well thought out, that we're hearing a lot of research or, or information from in our research. So here's kind of the next slide that really kind of gets into some of the stuff that we heard. Uh, for instance, first impressions, trucking participants understand the need for alternative revenue sources more so than the general public, partly because they're kind of already in that mode that's part of their business they actually know that they pay a motor fuels tax and it's through ifta which is the international fuel taxes uh at, act no anyway it's an agreement i think agreement and somebody's going to correct me please uh it basically says that they will there's a clearinghouse that puts out based on mileage the revenues that are collected from each of those trucking agencies or trucking companies or truckers that comes back then to each of the states. So there's a mechanism out there that they're familiar with already that does some of this. Uh, who runs it and how? State agencies generally are seen, this is what we're hearing from folks, as trustworthy administrators, in particular KDOT, uh, which was good to hear, quite frankly. Uh, it's kind of good to hear that you've got some good credibility out not to say that we didn't hear, well, you know, I don't know if I really trust what you're going to do. Uh, but again, good to hear. We need to be able to have that conversation. And so you can read some of the others. I really kind of wanted to pull out that 
we're hearing a multitude of different things from different people from different ways that we're at we were asking questions to really get that insight so if you'll switch to the next slide and i promise i am almost done this is it we are going to ultimately culminate in a pilot where we are going to request and seek out volunteers uh, to take on the role and responsibility of of trying something out here, see what see what works, what doesn't work, and that we're beginning to put out a menu of options potentially for how this could work. So somebody might say, "Yeah, sign me up for it. I'll take on one of those OBD things, kind of like my insurance company gives me to to track." stuff how safe i'm driving and i'll i'll plug that in and use it and I, i'm really curious or somebody might say yeah no i don't think i really want to do that or uh so how about can i just take a picture of my odometer and send it in to you every month and let, let's go with that that way you're not really kind of paying attention to where i'm driving what roads i'm on when i'm driving them or even the next step would be is how about pen and paper let me just do pen and paper I'll, I'll write it down and submit it. Each of those comes with different trade-offs, essentially, as far as how things work, how much work it is for folks. So those, those pieces actually play into that. And that's where this research that we're doing through the um, further in-depth kind of conversations and what we've heard already will help us develop a menu of options. And we come ask for folks to volunteer, and we've already had a bunch. Anybody that wants to, the, I'm, I'm taking names. Uh, they don't have to, but hey, uh, the more the merrier. We're going to try and have a large group of people, uh, potentially several hundred, uh, to try this out, really to test this. Uh, one thing I didn't note is we are also partnering with Minnesota DOT. They're going to do their own version of this pilot here when we do it to get another kind of subsection or view of, of a rural aspect. With that, you can change the next slide, and that's really the conclusion of my portion of the presentation. Uh, happy to stand for questions at the appropriate time, but I know we've got several other folks. Yeah, uh, committee, one of the things I would ask that you do is, if you do have questions, let's try to lim limit them to the study that we're doing. I think some of the other uh, conferees will be able to answer stuff about trends, um, maybe what other states are doing. but. Uh, Joel's got another meeting that he may have to pop out on so he wouldn't be available for questions about the study. So anybody got any questions? Representative Minix. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I studied this a little bit last year, and I'm, I'm struggling with some things. Uh, you talked about mileage on road usage. We're talking about the wear and tear on our highways, basically. Are these electric vehicles the same weight as an internal combustion engine? Uh, there tend to be, I might have to defer to someone from the automotive and innovation group, but they tend to be about, they're usually a little bit heavier, I believe, just because of the battery weight uh, that's in those vehicles. But it's not, once you, until you get to large vehicles, it's not, of great substance towards the road conditions and wear and tear. It's not a huge difference between the two. At least that's our understanding. Last year, as we Polaris came to us and wanted to to talk about uh, selling side by sides in the in Kansas that were electric versus the combustion. They needed to raise the weight limit from two thousand pounds to three thousand pounds. To me, that's that's a much heavier vehicle. Uh, as, as we're looking at electric vehicles, I think we need to fashion this in some manner so that we can provide for other fuel sor sources in the future, like hydrogen fuel cells, so that we we don't go from gasoline tax to a mileage tax to something else if, if we can do this on somewhat of a universal basis. And I know a lot of people in my area, uh, western Kansas, lots of miles, but some of the a good portion of some of those miles are off the highways and off the roadways. A uh, person will go out and wander around a section, checking cows, drive two miles, get on the road, a county road, drive up a mile and do the same thing. They get far more off-road usage. And, and so there's, there's lots of exceptions to, for some of these rules that we're looking at setting up. Thank you. Representative Goddard. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Welcome, Joel. Good to see you again. Um, your, one of your first slides talked about fairness and equitability. I think that's really critical because 
um, everybody needs to pay a road use tax in some manner, shape, or form. I'm almost thinking that a, um, a road use fee based on max gross vehicle weight may be the way to go. Who cares how many miles you drive? You know, um, if, if a vehicle is on the light end, they pay a lower fee. If they're on a real heavy end, for example, if they're a, a three-quarter ton pickup truck with a huge battery and stuff, maybe they pay a bigger fee. The other thing as a part of that is Kansans will eventually have to pay some kind of road use fee. But how do we handle the people transiting our state? Right now, when they come through, they'll buy a tank of gas and they pay a, tax, a gas tax. Um, if they're using electrical charging stations, maybe our people who use them have a particular credit card or something that would identify them as Kansas residents and, and the out-of-state people would get hit with the three cents, uh, a kilowatt hour or four cents, whatever it may be. I'd like to hear your comments on that. Uh, sure. No, great great comments and great questions uh i think yeah those are like things that we are consciously thinking about especially and i want to hit on the first or the last one first here and the fact that i think there are potential answers for addressing out-of-state travel uh it comes again with here are your pros and your cons it, and the, the way that you can do it in a sense is through technology if you put a geofence up around the state of kansas or around a section of highway you know when it's hit a vehicle has hit it not necessarily whose vehicle but a vehicle has hit it and when you potentially exit not, not unlike actually what the turnpike is looking at with their uh cashless tolling uh in a sense so there are ways to address out of state or transit uh vehicles uh through rock or through a road usage charge um then the the earlier question um refresh my memory what the first one max, was max yes max weight. Gross weight and i think there are people that, that actually are are looking at it i might defer a bit to uh doug who i think has looked at some of these across the other states through ncsl and or over travis uh but i think we're open to the conversation really we're, we're right now we're really just exploring what are possible options thank you thank you very much thank you mr chair representative Tumper day Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I try and keep this brief because I know we got other speakers there. But uh, on the one page, you went into the special registration on, on surcharges for electric vehicles. We're already doing that. You recognize that. The mileage based road usage charges. My concern on there is privacy invasion issues. We got Big Brother tra tracking my mileage and where I'm going. Uh, taxing electric electricity used by the vehicles. Question comes down is how do you track it? Think of diesel. I've got clear diesel. I got red diesel. Uh, electricity. Technically, I got red electricity and I got clear electricity. So are you going to do an invasion into my garage if I hook up the power there? Or are you going to track my home's electric usage? So what I would implore you to do, I have read extensive studies from different states around the country. Uh, Virginia has some excellent studies that they've really dove into. Please don't reinvent the wheel. There, there are some uh, answers out there. So thank you. Well, I just want to kind of tag on to what you said, Representative. Um, I think it's really important as, as Kansas tries to come to grips with this technology and how it's going to affect our roads, that we reach out to Joel. Um, you know, he's kind of the lead point on this policy. So he knows what the concerns are. I mean, the reality of it is we're going to have this budget hole eventually in transportation. We have to address it somehow. But if, if he can understand the concerns, well, I mean, that's how we start to work around those things. Representative Neely. Just real quickly on what he's talking about and what you were talking about and you. Uh, the surcharge, I was happy to hear that because I just had a meeting with like the electrical co-ops, et cetera. And their concern was, that you have multiple people putting these large charging stations, for example, in a cul-de-sac, they're gonna blow that transformer. And their fear was the intrusiveness of people knowing I've got an electric car, et cetera, asking me all these questions, do I have the electrical charging station, et cetera. But if we're already charging a surcharge, we already know they have an electrical vehicle, et cetera. I think we're going to have to work together on that type of situation too. 
so that we don't have issues where we blow transformers, put people's, do you agree with that? I, I would agree. And I think uh, there's actually a panelist uh, at the end, Ben, uh, who works with ChargePoint, who does a lot of the commercial installation of charging stations, could maybe talk more uh, effectively to that. But yes, I think that is a concern that, we, uh, that we've seen. All right. Thank you very much, Joel. I don't want to... Uh... Yes, Representative Ballard. I'm sorry. I just want to follow up on that, and I'll make it really quick. All right. You says that the the elect the electric mm. can't even talk. Tax would be different, except for ex your electricity dispensed in your residence. Okay. So, so will that rate be higher, or will utilities have two rates that they charge if they know you are doing that versus just your house? So great question. And technically, uh, we're not really exploring that piece, but I think the bill speaks a bit to that. And uh, the bill that uh, you're going to have a hearing on next week tied to charging a tax on when you charge your vehicle, the amount of kilowatt hours you use, there's a rate set within that. And it's meant only right now for, I believe, commercial stations. So the ones that are out in the public, like if you stop at a rest area or an Arby's, or a, a hotel that that might work there. It wasn't, it isn't tied currently to like your private residence. And so it would be specifically to that metered device. I do not have a follow-up. Thank you, Representative. Um, but uh, to carry on with what's already been said, uh, on Tuesday, I'm planning on having a hearing on House Bill 2004. Uh, it was introduced by Representative Riley. Uh, and I think some of these questions can be asked to the charge point guy. That's one of the reasons I specifically wanted him on this panel uh, so that maybe we could flesh that out a little bit. Uh, again, thanks, Joel. And let's move on to the next conferee, uh, Doug Schinkel with uh, NCSL. Doug, are you uh, on WebEx? Yeah, Representative Francis, can you hear me? Yeah, sure can. Okay. Take it away, buddy. Yeah, thank you very much, Chairman Francis, for having me and members of the committee. I really appreciate it. Let me just get my uh, presentation pulled up here. Uh, my name is Douglas Schinkel. I am the Transportation Program Director at the National Conference of State Legislatures. Um, for those of you who don't know, um, NCSL is a membership organization comprised of all 50 states, and you all are entitled um, to our services. Um, and can you see my presentation now? We can. Okay, let me just get it um, up in slideshow. Does that look good how you can see it there? Looks good. Okay. Uh, yeah, so like I said, I'm the Transportation Program Director at NCSL, a membership organization that serves all 50 state legislatures. Worked a lot with Representative Francis and some other members of the committee uh, in the past and have worked with Joel, so appreciate his conversation. And I would share that I also am interested in hearing what the automotive industry and ChargePoint have to say about all this because there are some, uh, I think, technical questions with regards to collecting some of these proposed fees um, that the industries would be able to, to provide some invaluable insight on. So basically, I'm going to run through this presentation, give you a quick sense of what states are doing um, at at the, at the state legislative level to look at and explore and implement new user fees with an emphasis on road usage charges and per kilowatt hour fees. The one other thing I would mention is that Representative Francis is actually co-chair of an effort that has just been established by NCSL, a bipartisan effort to look at alternative transportation user fees. Um, and we will be doing that over the next year. Um, his Representative Francis and his co-chair for that partnership is uh, Hawaii Senator Chris Lee. And really the purpose of that partnership is to bring in very much like you all are doing today, bringing in some experts from if from around the country to learn about these various options, the pros and cons of them, how they might work, some of the um, political and, and, and kind of communications questions. Um, so we, Representative Francis should be able to hopefully share throughout as the year goes on some of the, the findings from that partnership. So let, with that, let me go to the, just make sure, go, do you guys, guys see in the next slide with the pie graphs now? Yes. Okay, very good. So this is just a slide from American Road and Transportation Builders Association. And it's just kind of demonstrating uh, the revenue mix that states are get, where states are kind of getting their transportation uh, revenue from. And you can see back in 2000 that that 50, uh, highway user fees, tolls, and taxes made up 
about 55% of that, shrunk all the way down to 42% by 2015, rebound a bit by 2020 back to 44%. And that's probably in part because a number of states uh, did pass uh, gas tax increases during the uh, the the last decade, essentially. Um, but you will see that, that this kind of dynamic that we're talking about here is, is definitely taking place nationally. And then we're seeing this at the state level in terms of uh, studies we're seeing from Louisiana, Illinois, Pennsylvania, numerous states showing um, projected decline decline in particular motor fuel taxes as um, more vehicles either do not use fuel or the the vehicles are more fuel efficient and use less fuel. Um, and so that's really driving a lot of these conversations across the country. And so the first thing I'll just mention very quickly is that since 2013, 33 states in the District of Columbia did increase their gas tax. Um, 23 states in D.C. do have an indexed or variable rate gas tax, which allows it to track with the economy to a certain extent. Um, and so there are a lot of states have taken effort, uh, taken steps there. But you, you get the sense when talking to your peers and other state um, uh, transportation committees that um, while there, the, there may be another gas tax um, increase perhaps in some states that the most states are feeling like um, they really need to focus on the users that are perhaps not paying as much or any into the existing system. Like I said, um, alternative fuel vehicles and, and, and high fuel efficiency vehicles and hybrids and what have you. And so this, one of the most common strategies, and this is what I know was something that's being discussed in Kansas, is the establishment of special EV and hybrid fees. So 31 states have a um, fee on electric vehicle, as you can see, those indicated in green here. And then 18 states have a hybrid fee. That's not really represented in this map, uh, but, you, but, but, the, but that's the number. And for comparison's sake, the, 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 amount of electric vehicle registration fee. And this is a flat fee that you pay if you have an electric vehicle or a hybrid when you register your vehicle. It's not tied to use anyways. It's just tied to ownership of a certain kind of vehicle. Um, for electric vehicles, uh, the fees range from $50 all the way up to $225. So there's quite a range there. And there is a question about, you know, how you best come up with this number. Typically states are trying to take a crack at uh, getting something that approximates what they're losing out on from that those drivers in terms of uh, in terms of the gas tax, but of course that's somewhat of an imperfect science, and there are so many variables involved there. But uh, that's something we're seeing a lot of. Expecting to see you know a couple more states and enacted such of these fees just last year, and expecting to see some more of this, but also see states maybe transition a little more to thinking from the the user perspective that. Obviously, the drawback with this is kind of the example that I think Joel gave with like, you know, you have someone who doesn't drive because they're an older citizen and they they just don't need to drive very much or someone who just doesn't drive out of because their lifestyle allows them to walk or just, you know, doesn't drive much. Um, they're getting charged the same as as someone who's driving a lot. So I think that's the one, you know, kind of drawback to to a flat fee, but also recognizing that this makes a lot of sense and it's kind of in the easiest um, kind of. Um, maybe at the front hand, front that you can do before you think about moving to maybe a, a user fee option. So I would mention too, and this is obviously something that Joel spoke about, that 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 a number of states have been taking uh, advantage of federal grant funding to help investigate and study these various options. And you'll see the Kansas and Minnesota um, collaboration and, and study that Joel's working on listed there as one of those one of the states that recently uh, in FY 2020 re received some funding from the federal government. The new in uh, infrastructure uh, and investment jo and investment and jobs act um, IIJA did keep this program but kind of made a few tweaks and renamed it and the new name is escaping me but i can tell you when i grab my notes in a second um but so there will be more money out here and so there's more opportunities for states to kind of investigate alternative transportation user fees um do some public communication surveys, public opinion surveys, like Joel, you know, indicated Kansas is doing, um, run some pilots, et cetera. So there's a lot of kind of interesting work going on out there throughout the country here. So keep in mind, we will, um, I will share with Representative Francis when we see the new, um, the new uh, funding eligibility for the the newest pot of money that should be hopefully sometime in in the coming year. 
Um, this is somewhat similar to the map that Joel shared, so I won't go into it a lot, but essentially at this point, we're going to, we're going to talk about road usage charges for a moment. And there's three states that have operational RUC programs, Oregon, Utah, and Virginia, and that order of when they were kind of implemented. Uh, there's a number of other states kind of studying the issues. There's some kind of interoperability pilots going on, getting into that question, or how are we going to address how, um, drivers from other states? And that is a, a tricky question. And there is, I will mention that the IIJA also had a national pilot language to start a national RUC pilot. Um, no news yet on that getting started, but I would hope one of the main um, kind of areas of study for that national pilot will be looking at those interoperability questions. But we, you will note that California, Oregon, and Washington are already looking into that, and they've actually tested um, and I know Travis Dunn can probably speak to this as well, uh, but with CDM Smith, but um, they've been testing actually um, drivers driving into others into those other, you know, between California, Oregon and Washington and kind of mock um, money being exchanged between states and between systems. So it's certainly possible, but it would of course require um, a level of coordination and communication amongst uh, state DOTs or whoever's tasked with um, collecting these funds. But this is kind of the lay of the land, what's going on there. Um, I wanna kind of briefly talk about the three states that have these, these operational RUC programs. None of them have very many drivers in them. I want to say that Virginia is the highest. They have about 7,000 or 8,000 drivers enrolled in their program now, I believe, and I'll talk about them on the next slide. But um, Utah and Oregon were the first two programs to be established. They're both um, established um, by uh, legislative statutory authority. Uh, Oregon's has been around for a bit longer. Um, I would say some of the key differences, um, going back to kind of represent Francis talking about making sure that you're capturing revenue from electric vehicles, but also other types of alternative fuel vehicles, but also vehicles that get very high efficiency if your state would choose to do so. And you would see with respect to Utah that they include um, plug-in hybrid and gasoline hybrid vehicles. You can see with uh, Oregon that they're um, including electric plug-in compressed natural gas and propane vehicles um, so that there that that is not just electric vehicles paying into this uh utah decided to just go with one vendor uh that uh, that, that uh, cooperates with the uh, utah dot um, whereas oregon dot has three different payment and vendor options and the thinking behind that at the time was that some folks are going to be skeptical of sharing their information with the government, whereas others might be skeptical of sharing their information with a private business. So you give a mix of kind of vendors and that will um, give consumers choices. I think that makes sense to a certain degree, although I would caution that in the end, it's probably more efficient in terms of administrative costs to just have one vendor. And so perhaps we'll see, perhaps that's what, um, what we'll see in the future. I would also mention with all of these programs that if you, enroll in these voluntary programs. These are all voluntary at this point in time, but they're a way to kind of test out these systems and see they, how they work. But if you enroll in these programs that you um, don't have to pay the electric vehicle registration fee, um, or if there's a hybrid fee in your state for those such vehicles. So you get exempted from that. Um, so I think that's important. They have fairly similar um, per mile um, charge rates. Um, and I would say they're all kind of progressing along and that the states are learning more about how these programs work and how to improve them in the future. And I know the legislatures in these states are looking at what they can do to perhaps um, tweak these programs and perhaps compel more people to enroll in them. So the other program and the most recently one created was, and now I'm having trouble going to the next slide, so give me a second, um, is Virginia. Uh, and theirs was created and went live very quickly. And so we went live just last summer. And like I said, they have the most uh, uh, enrollees now. And they once again just have one vendor, Emovis, who's, who's collecting the funds for um, for the rock. They call it a mileage choice um, program. And theirs is a little more complicated about in terms of calculating it. Um, but nonetheless, they've been doing a lot of, all these states have been doing a lot of public communication around this because clearly this is something this is going to raise um, questions from uh, elected officials such as, such as yourself, but, you know, of course, the traveling public. 
So I want to talk a little bit about recent enacted state rec legislation because I think it will give you a sense maybe of some of the trends and some of the questions and things that states are grappling with. So California, I would mention, um, besides the three states with operational programs, other states that are really kind of ahead of the curve here are California, Washington, uh, and Hawaii, I would probably say. And there's probably a couple other states you could throw in the mix there. Uh, and then there's states like Joel said with Kansas that I think are in a good space because you're not at the bleeding edge, but uh, you're not far behind, which is, I think, a good place to be at this point. But uh, the California, um, they just extended their pilot, and there's been legislation before to create an actual operational um, program, but that hasn't happened as of yet. They're doing, they're also doing some researching about um, public opinion amongst rural users and um, tribal members, uh, so somewhat similar to some of the work in Kansas. And interestingly, they're doing a test, and of course, we're going to have different examples from different states. Um, California, very focused focus on greenhouse gas emissions. They're going to try and do a pilot that work, that tries to um, assess a differing ruck based on your environmental basically impact. Um, so that's kind of an interesting wrinkle. Um, your neighbor, Kansas's neighbor to the south, Oklahoma, established a road user um, charge task force a couple of years ago. Um, and that's still meeting. And in the meantime, they have uh, implemented a per kilowatt hour fee, which we'll talk about in a moment. So um, I've been going to connect, represent Francis with uh, his uh, peer in the Oklahoma House Transportation Committee so they can learn more about, so you all can kind of together learn a little bit more about what's going on in your neighbor to the south. And then I would mention here for my next slide, give me one second, sorry, uh, that just interestingly, these two failed bills from last year from Hawaii and Washington, this is what I think the next vanguard is that um, both of these states would have basically established some sort of mandatory RUC program or MBUF as you see here for Hawaii sometimes. Sometimes that freight phrase is used means mileage based user fee program. Um, these both would have established a mandatory ruck program beginning a certain year for certain vehicles. Um, obviously, the more vehicles you get into the system, the more you can kind of bring down administrative costs, the more you can actually raise revenue. These three operational programs in Oregon, Utah, and Virginia at the moment are not even bringing in more money um, than they're costing administrative costs, but we're really, you know, an early point in all this. But my prediction is that we're going to have some states that are going to take the leap and require enrollment in a RUC system for certain kind of vehicles. And we'll see how that un enrolls um, kind of happens in the next couple of years. Um, some climate fo focused transportation packages I'll kind of skip over, but Colorado and Washington State have taken some interesting steps to fund their transportation system with things like fees on um, Uber and Lyft rides, on Amazon and other type of retail delivery fees and other things like that. I won't belabor that. And I want to talk about per kilowatt hour charges a little bit. So as, Ro as Joel mentioned, three, there's actually four states. These three states have enacted kilowatt hour charges just recently. But as Joel mentioned, none of them have implemented them yet. They're supposedly just getting started in Kentucky and Iowa. And we're trying to kind of check in and, and see what's going on there with that, because there are some questions about how this will be implemented. Um, and then Pennsylvania has had such a charge. We've heard since the 1990s, and we've heard rumors that it might actually be repealed and no one actually was really collecting it. Um, I do think there are some very open questions about how you collect this. If it's just at public charging stations, I think that's a little bit simpler, but I'll be curious to see what the folks with charge points say in terms of like, do they have the necessary technology um, to capture the pil per kilowatt hour excise tax? Um, and then, of course, there's the equity question. If you're not putting this in folks' homes, um, then there's once again some some users that are not necessarily paying in the system if they're if they're charging at home. If this is only for um, um, public charging stations. And then uh, next slide, sorry. And really, here's just some funny some resources and. Here's a smiling picture of myself. And with that, that's really my presentation and happy to take questions from the audience. And I know you have a lot of other presenters, so I won't be offended if you don't ask me any questions, but I'm here to be a resource. Thank you very much. And thanks for having me. Let's uh, kind of move on to the next one. And if we have some questions, we want to ask Joel after we get through the next presentation and see how much time we have. Thanks, Joel, or Doug. Thanks so much for uh, taking the time to share with us today. 
Uh, so next on the agenda is Travis Dunn with uh, CDM Smith. Welcome to the committee, Travis. Good afternoon, Chairman Francis. Thank you. And thank you for the panel. Uh, are you able to run the slides for me? Okay. Perfect. Um, I will skip over the items in my presentation that are repetitive, but what I'd like to do uh, is lay out, uh, building on the three primary revenue mechanisms that you've already heard about, how other states are assessing them and then adjusting them to be able to address a lot of the concerns that we've already heard through the questions today, as well as through the research that the states are doing into uh, future gas tax alternatives. Uh, so Travis Dunn, CDM Smith, that's me. Next slide is uh, just to recap the three categories. We restrain it to these three categories. These are all uh, revenue mechanisms that have a nexus to transportation and can generate sufficient revenue. I always like to use the tire tax as a counter example. If you wanna fund transportation through taxing tires, the tax will be more than the tire is worth. Uh, but if you tax vehicles or usage or energy, you can actually generate significant revenue without impacting the underlying cost of the thing that you're taxing, which is why these three categories tend to be uh, most common. Uh, next slide covers the uh, Association of International CPAs, who gives us a great guidebook for tax principles. They have a dozen of them. I've kind of organized it into eight that will seem familiar. And, and we usually start here uh, in our research with states on how to assess different options. And I'll talk about four that tend to rise to the top. User pay, which is fair, a form of fairness. Uh, user convenience. Administrative efficiency, which is the other side of the user convenience coin and then privacy or information security, which is uh, increasingly coming up when we talk about mileage-based fees or kilowatt hour taxes in the home. So with the next slide, I'll, I'll just go through each mechanism. Vehicle fees you've heard about, you have electric vehicle surcharges, you have hybrid ele electric surcharges and uh, conventional hybrid surcharges. Um, I wanna give you a picture of how these fees uh, look when you map them across the country. On the next slide, you'll see sort of a scatter plot. You can see Kansas is the red dot. Uh, so if you draw a line down, Kansas is about, it's a $70 effective electric vehicle surcharge. And if you draw a line over to the left, Kansas uh, in 2022 had about 3% of new vehicles sold were electric. So one of the questions that comes up with these flat fees is uh, concerns about uh, discouraging adoption of electric vehicles. So all the way on the right, that last blue dot is Washington, $225 annual surcharge on electric vehicles, second highest adoption rate of EVs. California is the blue dot at the top on the $100 line, uh, leading the nation with almost 20% of new cars sold electric last year, and their fee is $100. Um, so how to set the fee, as Doug mentioned, is, is the key question. Do you want it to replicate what the average vehicle is paying in fuel tax uh, or something different? And how do you set it without discouraging consumers from adopting alternative fuel vehicles? And importantly, because a lot of the concerns about fuel tax are tied to improving fuel economy, you see it in states like Kansas, uh, hybrid fees. So on the next slide, a wrinkle that is uh, emerged is, uh, well, w taxing a technology like a hybrid doesn't necessarily counteract the fuel tax loss. That vehicle on the right gets 15 miles per gallon. It's paying a lot of fuel tax, but it's a hybrid. Uh, so if you do a hybrid uh, surcharge, that vehicle will end up basically paying more than, than perhaps was intended. Uh, and then on the next slide, you have the same issue with the plug-in hybrid vehicles. These are vehicles that can go a, a certain distance on electricity and then switch to gasoline power. So on the right-hand side, again, you have a vehicle that's a plug-in hybrid. It happens to be a luxury vehicle. It can go 18 miles on a, a battery charge, and then it switches to a gasoline-powered motor, which only gets 18 miles per gallon. So if you're picking a technology-based surcharge, you run into this challenge of how to set the rate fairly across the vehicle fleet. Next slide, just kind of recap some of the uh, pros and cons against those four key criteria. Uh, again, uh, as has already been discussed, a uh, flat fee, low mileage drivers are subsidizing high mileage drivers. So basically everyone's either paying too much or, or too little, but it's easy, you already do it. Uh, you can collect it as part of the annual vehicle registration. Uh, which is convenient for users until the fee gets to be too high. And in states that have other taxes collected at the point of vehicle registration, it's becoming a challenge. $500, $600, $700 dollars all at once becomes a challenge for customers to pay. Uh, so you run into hurdles about that lump sum fee. Uh, if we open the right-hand side of this slide, 
the administrative efficiency uh, obviously is uh, on the next slide um, very simple to administer. Uh, however, again, if you get those fees too high, you run into compliance issues. People don't renew their vehicle registration because they want to avoid the higher fees. So there is a bit of a trade-off in the administration of these fees. Uh, no privacy issues, though. We're not asking people to uh, provide any information that they aren't already providing uh, with an electric vehicle or technology-based vehicle surcharge. On the road usage charge or uh, usage-based charge on the next slide, I wanted to give a sense of the range of, of ways that uh, miles driven can be reported. And the states that have this program in place all have the flat fee as an option. So the only additional piece of information that's needed to administer a usage-based charge is how many miles were driven. And there's a lot of ways to collect that information, as Joel said. You can have it be self-reported, uh, or you can, on the right-hand side of the spectrum, look at technology options for wirelessly reporting miles driven. Uh, but fundamentally, that's all the state needs to be able to administer a program like this. But it is complicated to get that information, uh, depending on what choices are made about the mileage reporting choices. Um, what's more interesting to me than the technology on the next slide is that the usage charge introduces policy choices uh, for legislatures, in including uh, committees like yours, to make. Uh, now you have a, a fee mechanism uh, that can be introduced only on certain types of vehicles. You have options for how to set the rates. You can vary those rates in different ways for different vehicle types. Choices about how to report miles driven. Uh, exemptions, I think as was mentioned, for off-road driving, whether to offer that, and if so, how, and how to verify those types of exemptions. Uh, payment frequency and, and enforcement. And of course, each of these choices will have implications for how the system is administered and how costly it might be to actually uh, set up a fee collection mechanism and, co and collect the funds in a way that uh, you have a high level of uh, compliance and trust in the system from the taxpayers. So assessing the usage charge on the next slide, um, the reason it keeps rising to the top among so many states is because it preserves that user pay principle that the gas tax has embodied for so many years. Uh, how much you use is how much you pay. And uh, for states that are really getting into the policy, they're finding interesting ways to vary the rates. Um, so for example, uh, to the question about uh, Western Kansans who, who drive a lot more miles, uh, one concept that's been talked about in, in another state is uh, perhaps providing a reduced rate for miles driven above a certain amount. So there's ways you can vary the rate setting to accommodate specific concerns in a way that you can't do with uh, vehicle fees or, or gas taxes. Of course, uh, the user convenience side of this is very challenging because you're asking people to do something they don't currently do, uh, which is to report how many miles they've driven um, and make a payment on it. So if you bundle that payment with an existing payment, it might be less painful, uh, but nevertheless, there, there's an extra step for customers to take. And the next slide, we see the administrative efficiency as a result also is more complicated. It will be more costly it will be more complicated than a vehicle fee or a fuel tax, but you can leverage motor vehicle agencies like the Department of Revenue in, in, in Kansas to handle the transactions because they already have the customer relationships. Privacy uh, has been mentioned a few times. Uh, this is the number one concern in every state that studied this issue going back 20 years. Uh, so the states that have done research have, have found ways to manage the privacy issue. It comes down to fundamentally two approaches one is what are you asking drivers to provide in terms of the information and reducing the ask down to all, all the state needs to administer a fee is how many miles did you drive or how many miles did you drive on public roads in Kansas? That's the only piece of information the state needs to get. So by protecting the, the type of information that's provided, you can provide a system form of privacy protection. But the second piece that's equally, if not more important, is putting privacy protection provisions in law that obligate the state agency administering the program to protect the data they collected, not use it for purposes other than fee administration, and giving customers a right of redress if there is any misuse. And that's uh, what you've seen done in, in Oregon, for example. So lastly, I'll touch on kilowatt hour charges, but I, I too am uh, interested in, in our colleague from ChargePoint comments on this. I'll just tee it up a bit on the next slide with um, the two different approaches to uh, kilowatt hour taxes or energy taxes. You have the at public charging station approach, which in the three states that have it, uh, putting aside Pennsylvania, 
uh, uh, the purpose is to collect road usage fees for visitors from out of state. So by taxing kilowatt hours at public charging stations, that's the stated purpose. And in all three states, Iowa, Oklahoma, and Kentucky, you see that policy paired with the flat vehicle fee on electric vehicles for resident EVs in those states. So this really is aimed at capturing uh, road usage by electric vehicles coming from out of state, which makes sense because over 80% of charging occurs at home. I'll get to that in a moment. Um, I'm sure our colleague from ChargePoint will address the issues about the definition of what is a public charging station, how to define a kilowatt hour and verify and measure it. And there are a lot of different ways that public charging stations sell electricity and not all of them sell kilowatt hours. Some of them sell time and some of them sell uh, memberships. So applying a tax is not uh, necessarily straightforward. The more complicated approach is uh, taxing kilowatt hours at home. Um, so it fundamentally can't be done or at least very difficult to do if you're plugging your electric vehicle into a conventional wall socket, 120 volt. Uh, there's no way to disaggregate the electrons going from that, uh, from that plug into your car from the electrons going into other appliances in your house. If you have a level two charger, uh, which is this faster charger that you can install on the type of plug that you have for, for example, for a, a dryer, um, you, you can disaggregate it, but it requires a submeter. So now you have the electric utility installing a piece of equipment to measure the kilowatt hours that are going through that uh, channel as opposed to the rest of your residence or your, um, or your business. Um, so you've introduced the electric utility as a, basically as a tax collector and, and given them some responsibility for measurement, collection, uh, customer service, and uh, remitting those taxes. Uh, so the at-home kilowatt hour charging concept um, has a lot more uh, hurdles to overcome uh, to be viable than, than the uh, public charging station concept. Next slide. Uh, just to recap, um, energy taxes, uh, they sort of fail on the user pay principle uh, compared to uh, even a fuel tax or, or a usage-based charge because the, the correlation between how many kilowatt hours you are putting into your electric vehicle and how much you're using the road is, is indirect and it's tenuous. Uh, imagine you're using your uh, Ford F-150 Lightning to uh, perhaps charge your home or your campsite. Are you paying a road tax for that electricity? Um, so you sort of drift away from the user pay principle uh, if you rely on energy taxes, not, not to mention the future technologies, whatever they may be, hydrogen fuel cell or, or other future technologies for powering our vehicles. Um, the user convenience is probably simple for the public charging concept, but again, at home, uh, much more for the user uh, to do to comply with the tax, which necessarily implicates uh, the tax collecting agency as an administrator of a kilowatt hour tax, uh, being required to do uh, more measurement and introducing the utilities as a, uh, as a stakeholder in the administration of a kilowatt hour tax if it's at home. Um, probably no privacy concerns, uh, notwithstanding perhaps some co-op examples uh, for, the, for the more conventional public charging stations. But if you move to a home-based uh, kilowatt hour tax, uh, there will be some privacy concerns. Uh, that just like with the road usage charge can be at least somewhat managed by putting protections into law on the information that's collected. So lastly, just to recap, I uh, hope I've introduced some possible solutions uh, or maybe more issues to consider. Uh, but on the next slide, just to recap the three mechanisms. Um, next slide, please. Thanks. Uh, we can go ahead and advance two more because I've got the vehicle uh, fees are simple but blunt indirect, they're likely temporary solutions or at least an option relative to a usage-based fee in the states that have it. Um, you can give drivers a choice. You can pay a flat fee or you can report how much you used uh, the road system and pay based on usage. And both uh, Utah and Oregon have set up the system in that way. So we see vehicle fees as a probably a temporary solution. Um, but something you can do immediately, in fact, Kansas has already done with the road usage charge being a medium term solution that has a few more kinks to work out uh, to implement it in a way that's user friendly and cost effective. But a lot of solutions are out there. And uh, to the point of not reinventing the wheel, I think what Kansas research can do is take advantage of all the different ways of reporting miles driven that have been tested and studied and implemented 
and try to fashion one that works given the concerns that uh, Joel and the project team have heard from uh, the public outreach and, and from committees like this one. And then lastly, with energy taxes, a lot more work to be done. It's an emerging concept. It could be an important piece of the puzzle, especially for out-of-state vehicles. Uh, I will note that in Vermont, uh, this was studied pretty thoroughly, including the notion of providing a payment card for in-state residents to be exempted from a kilowatt hour tax should they charge at a public charging station. Ultimately, the concept was uh, discarded in favor of the first two as a simpler approach for getting started, either a, a flat fee or a usage charge rather than a kilowatt hour tax. Uh, but it does leave open the question of how to capture road usage from visitors from out of state, uh, and that hopefully will be answered by the work of uh, states that are working through regional consortia on the West Coast and the East Coast, as well as the, the federal uh, government's research into road usage charging, which we expect to kick off in the next year or two. So with that, I'm happy to uh, answer any questions now or at the end of the panel. Is there any questions? Does anybody have anything you want to ask? And, you know, I, I would kind of think we ought to focus on the kilowatt hour thing because we're going to have that hearing next week. I don't know if you'd be able to attend by WebEx maybe when we have that hearing also. Sure. Representative Ballard. Clarification. You said Vermont studied seriously the kilowatt or the residents? Um, the kilowatt hour tax at public charging stations for out of state visiting electric vehicles with a uh, with an exemption for Vermont residents who charge at public stations so that they wouldn't have to pay that additional tax. It would only be charged to visitors. That was the concept. Thank you. I need that clarification. Appreciate it. And how familiar are you? Was it? A Vermont or New Hampshire that actually explored trying to meter it at home and it kind of got a little controversial. I think, well, Vermont did this sort of in two phases. The first phase was a proposal to do it on all kilowatt hours. The Public Utility Commission studied that pr first proposal and, and then it got reduced to, okay, just public charging stations. And then that also was studied and then uh, they move forward with a proposal on a mileage based fee or, or a flat fee, which is currently pending before the legislature. Representative Telperdang. I'll, I'll keep this quick. But the, there's commercial charging stations out in the state now, correct? Correct. So are they currently charging any taxes for charge? Um, it, I believe it depends on the state, but largely no. Uh, they're, they are charging commercial fees to recover their their costs of distributing the electricity. Uh, so they're recovering the cost of the power uh, and perhaps the, you know, the cost of developing the site, I'm sure uh, Ben will be able to answer in more detail, but I'm not aware of any states that charge taxes on, certain like excise taxes on top of that, general taxes, property taxes and so forth. In some cases, sales taxes, but uh, not excise taxes related to road usage. I was just curious if they're charging taxes now or even a sales tax. Plus, we're charging a tax on registration. Are we not double taxing at that point? Right. Um, for the states that have a sales tax, it could be certainly interpreted by the customer as a double tax. If you were to carve out the excise tax portion, which would be a flat per kilowatt hour amount from the sales tax portion, which is a percentage, it probably still feels like a double tax, even if they're being used for different purposes. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Weigel. Thank you. Sure. Um, thank you for all your presentation. Uh, the more I was listening to all this, the more things that were just flooding through my uh, brain. Uh, one of the things that, uh, and everybody's talking about, is these privacy issues and how that's going to be handled. Uh, that concerns me quite a bit, especially if they're going to identify the person driving the car uh, where, the, where the, because if they're going to be tracking, they're going to know where they're going to be going. I mean, it's obvious. So that, that concerns me. So we're going to have to explore that a little bit more. But one other, one of the other things I was uh, thinking about when, when you're paying a surcharge for a, an EV vehicle, does that surcharge go down as they use that vehicle over a number of years? I mean, uh, I bought a nice pickup years ago, and the the uh, 
registration fees for that were pretty high. Now it's, you know, 80 bucks or what or something like that. So is, is that something that's going to occur with the, uh, uh, all electric vehicles or, or is it just going to be that, uh, I think somebody used the, the, the monetary figure $700. Is that going to be charged every year or is that a one-time fee? Oh, Representative Weigel, the um, states that have electric vehicles surcharges, it's a flat annual charge. It doesn't vary by the age or value of the vehicle. No, well, every, every year every when year they uh, get their new tag to put on that, they're going to pay that surcharge. Right. It's, a, it's designed to um, replace what they're not contributing in fuel tax, so it is recurring. There are uh, four states that have age-based fees where your older vehicles pay less for registration, uh, but that's different from the electric vehicle surcharge, which does not go down with age. Uh, the, all the electric vehicle fees are flat annual charges. A few of them, interestingly, don't apply when you purchase the vehicle. They only apply when you do your first renewal one or two years later. In Washington State, for example, you don't pay the surcharge at purchase, you only pay it a year later when you go to renew your registration, and then every year after that. Well, well is it the same amount? It's the same amount every year, yes. Okay. I, I think, Representative, one of the reasons ours goes down is a large portion of what we pay when we re-tag a car has to do with the property value of that truck. We've got a, a and I think that's why ours drops so much, the registration fees stay the same. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. We're going to have... Yes, go ahead. I'm sorry. Sorry, Director of Policy, Joel Skelly. Uh, just real quick to answer that question uh, and add on, you're absolutely right, uh, Chairman Francis. Uh, those property taxes that you pay is based on the value of the vehicle, but that actually does not go into the highway fund. The only piece that goes into the highway fund is that registration fee, which is either $30 or $40. So just, just to, it is constant every year, whether you've got a 1980 or a 19. 90 or a 2020 vehicle it's the same amount every year whether it's 10 years old two years old whatever it's always that value it doesn't go up or come down it's the property tax value which is based on the value of your car which depreciates yeah that's to local government we got to move on real quick and try to get uh nick uh, steingard in with the uh, alliance of automotive innovation hey joel uh, you've been so helpful on this. Do you want to see if maybe we can get the guy with ChargePoint to uh, maybe present by WebEx next Tuesday when we hear that as part of that 2000? Sure, I can help for that. Out. Yeah. If we can get that together and tell him my deepest apologies, but we got out late. And yeah, we're starting happy to, get to, happy to help facilitate that. So, Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so, Nick, are you still on? Yep, I'm here. Can you all hear all me? Right. My Welcome slides? to the committee. You guys can hear and see my slides. All right. Yep. All right. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Chairman Francis and committee members for the uh, opportunity to present today. I really appreciate it. And as you can tell, there's a lot of nuance to this conversation. Um, so uh, really appreciate being involved. My name is Nick Steingart. I'm the Director of State Affairs at the Alliance for Automotive uh, innovation. You are probably familiar um, with our organization and, and uh, drive one of our members' vehicles, uh, as, as you see on this slide, uh, with our list of members. Um, but we also, uh, we have an expanded membership that includes equipment suppliers, battery uh, producers and manufacturers, semiconductor makers, um, autonomous vehicle companies. So we uh, we really have a wide variety of uh, members that we're fortunate uh, to, to uh, be representing today. I am going to try and skip through some of the things that might have been repetitive and just keep this limited to new information. Um, first off, just to kick it off and sort of set the stage on where EVs, um, the EV market stands in Kansas, you'll see on this slide um, that 3.15% of all new vehicle registrations in quarter three of this year in Kansas were electric vehicles. That's the latest quarter that we have um, data available for. Um, I, you know, it, that the, it's important to point out, I think that um, what you see here is really a lot of regional variability. Um, states that have high adoption rates, California, Washington, Oregon, 
are clustered together in states, you know, within a percentage point of Kansas, uh, like Missouri, Nebraska, Oklahoma, um, and some others are, are all within a percentage point of where Kansas's EV adoption rate is. So it, it varies significantly by um, region of the country that you are in. Um, I think, you know, while these numbers might seem on the lower end right now, and compared to the national average of 7.1%, they are. Um, a few things to keep in mind, which is one, we see quarter over quarter growth um, across the country in EV adoption rate. Um, we see automakers bringing more uh, vehicles to market uh, and consumer demand for these vehicles remain high. Uh, you know, public polling and surveys on this indicates that a quarter to a third of, of consumers are looking at an EV as their next purchase. So um, on the next slide here, sort of where is the EV market going? I alluded to this on the last slide, but automakers are making massive commitments uh, to electrification uh, to the tune of $330 billion by 2025. Um, as far as EV projections go, I'm, I'm hesitant to make a projection. I think if you ask uh, 10 consultants for, for their idea on where EV adoption will look like by the end of this decade, you'll get 10 different answers. Um, you know, what I will say is there's a host of factors that are, are going to impact that. Um, everything from affordability of these vehicles and making sure they're available to the widest um, swath of consumers to charging accessibility um, and, and, of course, policies that either support or, or hinder EV adoption. You see on the right hand side of this slide, uh, currently 86 vehicle models. Uh, that are uh, EVs on the market right now and, and how that breaks down between battery electric vehicles and plug-in hybrid vehicles is almost evenly split and then a couple of fuel cell electric vehicles that are on the market right now. Um, and all those investments that I mentioned earlier are, are translating to another 50 models on the market by mid-decade. So you know, in, a, in a few years, you're, you'll be looking at 130 plus different electric vehicle options. Uh, on the market, and, and to put that in the context, ten years ago we had you know a handful, two or three uh, EV models available. So this is a, a significant and rapid transform transformation. Um, a lot of this has been covered on some of the previous slides. I think I'm the fourth one to have some version of this pie chart so far. Um, but as far as causes for declining gas tax revenues. Um, certainly EVs play some role in that, and I don't want to lose sight of that, but they're certainly not the only reason. Um, some of the presenters have mentioned, you know, fuel efficiency improve, has been improving year over year. Um, so that's another uh, contributing factor to why uh, highway funding collections are down. But um, the spending power of, of uh, departments of transportation is also down, whether that be from inflation, um, the cost of construction has outpaced inflation. Um, you know, unforeseen world events when we had $5 gallons of gas uh, costs last summer that caused people to drive less and, and, you know, the pandemic in 2020 when people were driving less. So these numbers aren't static and, and certainly world events and uh, uh, can contribute to uh, collections as well. As far as the... Uh, EV fees in Kansas, you've seen this as well from our perspective. Um, this is a pretty fair fee, and this is a, a good transition to the next slide here. Our position on EV, EV fees or kilowatt hour tax or uh, whatever method or collection uh, process states uh, elect to implement is that they should be equivalent to taxes paid by internal combustion uh, engine drivers. Uh, and we have a, a formula that I got on the slide here um, that, that kind of shows you how we arrive at that number um, from state to state using federal highway um, uh, um, data to, to arrive at those annual ICE equivalent numbers. Um, I, was, I was planning to get into some of the drawbacks and of each of these approaches. I'm going to skip that because I think the previous presenter did a good job. I would like to highlight our position um, on VMTs. Uh, this is the one uh, where we have the most concern uh, regarding who is collecting the data, who's processing it, who's remitting it um, back to the state. Um, there, there's also a lot of questions here with um, 
you know, they can be more punitive for rural drivers who have to uh, commute further on average or drive further on average, or if uh, or for commuters who who don't leave, live in the immediate immediate vicinity of where they work um, or uh, conduct, you know, their other businesses. So, um, you know, without a specific proposal in front of us, although I do understand that you'll have a hearing next week on the kilowatt hour tax. Um, you know, it's, it's sort of difficult for us to weigh in on one approach versus the other, but these are some of the lenses on this slide that I uh, tend to view these policies through, um, you know, freedom of movement and frequency of movement should not be curtailed, disincentivized, or penalized. Uh, I touched on this uh, on the last slide, but uh, ensuring parity and taxes paid, whether that's a gas vehicle or an internal combustion engine vehicle, um, you know, accounting for the wide variability of driving patterns, no matter uh, where you live or, or what your individual circumstances might be. Um, and, you know, not to lose sight of the fact, at least, but certainly not last, is um, funds should be you know directed towards transportation uh, and road funding and making sure those roads are adequately and safely maintained so i uh i, I uh, speeded through that so happy to take any questions uh, that anyone on the committee may have uh thank you nick and uh do we have two questions anybody got a question okay uh, I appreciate your testimony, and, and by the way, Nick, and any of the other presenters today, uh, we do, I do plan on having a hearing on the kilowatt hour tax next Tuesday, and we would really love your testimony. And also, Ben, uh, with ChargePoint, I really want to, Mr. Kessler, I want to really apologize that we ran out of time today, uh, and I'd love for you to reach out to my assistant, uh, Jennifer, to let us know whether you would like to testify or have your presentation Tuesday. Uh, you know, we really want to accommodate it. I think this is important information for us to know. Uh, with that, since there's no questions, um, there's nothing further for the committee. 